Welcome back, everyone, to Pontus Fathom Podcast, Episode 18, Dune and Anthroposophy. Uh, today, we're going to talk about uh, the works of Rudolf Steiner, specifically knowledge of the higher worlds, how it is achieved, and some resonances I find with uh, Frank Herbert's Dune. Uh, especially for the first half of Dune. So in a way, it kind of corresponds uh, with the release of the movie. And as you, as you may know, the, the Dune movie is only a portion of Frank Herbert's original book. But then I want to um, not only expand into some other areas regarding um, some anthrop anthroposophic thinking that I've, I see not only in Dune, but... Uh, in the later part of the book and as well as in the Dune Saga. And then I want to extend that into some other topics, into some uh, other fictions and some uh, other areas that I think will be really interesting to, uh, to discuss. So, hey, welcome back. Thanks for joining us again. Um, as you may know, I've uh, tried to build this channel and would like to get to a point where I'm doing these as a live uh, stream. But just waiting to get some audience built up. So if you like the topics that we discuss here on the podcast, uh, please leave a comment below. Uh, I've gotten some great feedback below from people, uh, some interesting links to some other people's content. So I really think it's a great start, uh, but we can do better to grow it. So uh, please help me out and uh, leave a comment. Like and subscribe, share the video if you can, ring the bell, and you can keep track of new podcasts coming up. And this way we can start getting this to a live stream and, uh, and really discuss things uh, that we discuss here on the channel. A lot of what we've been discussing has been around uh, esoterica, occult, uh, uh, for sure anthroposophy, theosophy, but also psychology, psychological interpretations. And then we kind of ground it in fiction, movies, film, cinema, ideas, as a way to sort of bridge the gap between what I'd like to think of it as that spectrum of imagination and how imagination is, is, on, is along a spectrum of spirituality. And, you know, we see with a lot of the classics uh, of fiction, science fiction, even anime, uh, film, the the works of artists that resonate with us end up showing us that they are either exploring these spiritual areas or exploring these. Even, I'll, I'll extend it to psychological areas, but um, and I think what's great about anthroposophy uh, that we'll talk about today is it really was Steiner's reaction to um, theosophy. And it's really grounded in the idea of our human lives. So what, what, what better place to start with anthroposophy than with Dune? Uh, the story in, in many ways uh, of a transformation story, right? From, from Paul to Muad'Dib, sort of a Dune trans transformation stories. Uh, so uh, definitely we'll kind of dig into Dune a bit. In Steiner's uh, Knowledge of Higher Worlds, he talks about a number of interesting areas. So first of all, as, anthropo as an anthroposophical work, um, this is really sort of a, a guide to uh, knowledge of oneself and knowledge of one's place. So I'll, I'll just give you a little quick reading from the beginning. It says, in every human being, there slumber faculties by means of which he can acquire for himself a knowledge of higher worlds. The mystic, the Gnostic, the Theosophist have always spoken of a world of soul and a world of spirit, which are just as real to them as the world we can see with our physical eyes and touch with our physical hands. Anyone can listen to them, may at every moment say to himself, that of which they speak, I too can know. I can develop certain powers which today still slumber within me. It can only be matter, a matter of how to set the work to develop such faculties. And, you know, we, starting out with Dune, uh, we have, obviously, Dune is the story of Paul Atreides uh, on the desert planet Arrakis. And it really hinges around the 
control of Dune and the spice melange, but also the way melange fits into a psychological transformation tool in many ways uh, as the center of the universe. I, I just wanted, after reading that introduction phrase, I just wanted to read this quick uh, idea because we have the idea in Dune that the sleeper shall awaken, right? We have that vision of the sleeper shall awaken, right? And here we have um, Paul fell asleep to a dream of an Arakeen cavern, silent people all around him moving in the dim light of glow -go globes. It was solemn there and like a cathedral as he listened to a faint sound, the drip, drip, drip of water. And while he remained in the dream, Paul knew he would remember it upon awakening. He always remembered the dreams that were predictions. The dream faded. Paul awoke to feel himself in the warmth of the bed, thinking this world of Castle Caledon, without play or companions his own age, perhaps did not serve sadness and farewell. Uh, one thing that we have from Dune is this idea that the sleeper will awaken, right? Paul is sleeping. And if we go back into the space of knowledge of higher worlds, we have this metaphor of this uh, conditions of exoteric training. It says, um, so he kind of goes through this, Steiner goes through the idea of esoteric training where he talks about the conditions of esoteric training. Uh, to feel oneself as a member of humanity. To listen to the accomplishments, the knowledge that comes to one, to, to strive to improve. The fourth condition is to be convinced that the real being of humans lies not in the outer world, but in the inner world. Anyone who regards himself as a product merely of the outer world, as an outcome of the physical world, can achieve nothing in esoteric training. Right? It says, he should not force upon his environment anything for which it has no understanding. And so very much so in Dune, we have Paul moving from Caladan, um, more like an earthish planet, oceans and temperate and he moves to this harsh new world. And through Paul, we see this eyes of a new world, a new place to transform, transform himself. And they have the saying, the Fremen have the saying that um, Dune was, was made to test the faithful, right? So as Paul progresses through the book, he starts to um, realize his place in the Bene Gesserit plan, uh, in his place in... Uh, spiritual transformation. The spice begins to uh, increase his dreams. He starts to have these feelings of prediction. Um, the Bene Gesserit Reverend Mother asks him, do your dreams come true? And he just mentioned in that paragraph that his dreams do come true. And uh, as we go into that, there's a great passage here that says, uh, So the idea of, of having the dreams that are prescient is, again, seeing with different eyes, right? So he says, the organs thus formed are eyes of the spirit. With them, the pupil gradually learns to see something like psychic and spiritual colors. And once a person has acquired the faculty of seeing with spiritual eyes, he encounters sooner or later the beings mentioned, some of them higher rank than man, some of them lower rank. Uh, and this really resonates with Paul's ability to see his ancestors eventually, right? He starts to see other entities. He starts to see his own place in the world, right? He starts to see his own, um, uh, under all circumstances, however, one precautionary measure is necessary, and whoever is unwilling to adopt it would be well to advise to abstain from any attempt to make headway into occult science. It is essential that anyone who becomes a pupil should lose none of his qualities as a good, high-minded person or his sensitivity to physical reality. Throughout his training, indeed, he must continually enhance his moral strength, his inner purity, his powers of observation. To take one example only, during the elementary exercise for enlightenment, the pupil must take care to ensure that his compassion for the human and animal worlds and his response to the beauty of nature are constantly increasing. And with Dune, so we also have Paul's awareness of the Fremen, right? His awareness of Dune's 
uh, ecology. And something that was great about Herbert's work at its time was it was one of those novels that really had us learn about that connection between the ecology and the world. Uh, but, but of course, Paul is part of a tradition in the fiction of spiritual advancement, right? He's part of a school, he's part of a breeding program that's going to spiritually advance him, right? So unlike us, we're just humans, but we are also part of a real life breeding uh, activity in that we have ancestors, we have relatives, we come from families, we exist in a world in our country. So very much so we're all, uh, as Steiner would put it, on a path with conditions for that esoteric training, right? So uh, here Paul is with Jessica and she said, let go of me, he said. She heard him with the iron in his voice. She obeyed. Do you want to tell me what's wrong, Paul? Do you know what you were doing when you trained me? Did you know what you were doing when you trained me, he asked. There's no childhood in his voice, she thought. And she said, I hope things any parent hopes, that you'd be superior, different, different. She heard the bitterness in his tone. Paul, I, you didn't want a son, he said. You wanted a Quitsat Haderach. You wanted a male Bene Gesserit. She recoiled from his bitterness. But Paul, did you ever consult my father in this? She spoke gently out of the freshness of her voice. Whatever you are, Paul, the heredity is as much your father as me. But not the training, he said. Not the things that awakened the sleeper, right? The sleeper. It's here. He put a hand to his head and then to his breast. In me, it goes on and on and on and on. And Paul, she heard the hysteria edging his voice. Listen to me, he said. You wanted the Reverend Mother, mother to hear about my dreams. You listen in her place now. I've just had a waking dream. Do you know why? You must calm yourself, she said. If there's the spice, he said, it's everything here. The air, the soil, the food, the geriatric spice. It's like the truth slayer drug. It's a poison, she stiffened. His voice lowered and repeated, a poison so subtle, so insidious, so irreversible. It won't even kill you unless you stop taking it. We can't leave Arrakis unless we take part of Arrakis with us. The terrifying presence of his voice brooked no dispute. You and the spice. The spice changes anyone who gets this much of it. But thanks to you, I could bring the change to consciousness. I don't get to leave it in the unconscious where its disturbances can be blanked out. I can see it. Paul, you... I see it, he repeated. She heard the madness in his voice. Didn't know what to do, but he spoke again, and she heard the iron control return to him. We are trapped here. We are trapped here, she agreed. I must tell you of my waking dream, Paul said. Now there was fury in his voice. To be sure you accept what I say, I'll tell you first. I know you'll bear a daughter, my sister, here on Arrakis. Jessica placed her hands against the tent floor. Her, only her Bene Gesserit training had allowed her to read the first faint signals of her body, to know that the embryo was only a few, few weeks old. Only to serve, we exist only to serve. We will find a home among the Fremen, said, where your missionaria protectiva has brought us a bolt hold. The things that can happen here, I cannot begin to tell you, he said. I can't even begin to tell myself, although I have seen it. This sense of the future, I seem to have no control over it. The things just happen. This immediate future, say a year, I can see some of that. A road as broad as our central avenue on Caladan. Some places I didn't see, shadowed places, as though it was behind a hill. He fell silent as memory of that seeing filled him. No prescient dream, no experience of his life had prepared him for the totality which veils had been ripped away to reveal the naked time. Jessica found the tent's glow tab control and activated it. Dim green light drove back the shadows, easing her fear. She looked at Paul's face. It's the look of terrible awareness, she thought, of someone forced to the knowledge of his own mortality. He was no longer a child. There's a way to evade the Harkonnens, she said. The Harkonnens? Put those twisted humans out of your mind, he said, stated to her. You shouldn't refer to people as humans without, don't be so sure you know where to draw the line. We carry our past with us in another mind. There's a thing you don't know and we should, we should know. We are Harkonnens. Her mind did a terrifying thing. It blanked out the thought of sensation. 
Paul's voice went on. When you text and you find a mirror, study your face, study mine now. The traces are there. and Don't blind yourself to it. Look at my hands. Look at my sets of bones. I've seen a place. I've seen the data. We're a Harkonnens. A renegade branch of the family. That's it. Some Harkonnen cousin. You're the Baron's own daughter, he said. The Baron sim sampled many pleasures in his, in, in his use and once permitted him to be seduced. It was for the ge geriatric genetic purposes of the Bene Gesserit. One of you. The way he said you struck her like a slap, but it set her mind working. The daughter of the Bene Gesserit wanted, wasn't it the end, the old Atreides Harkona feud, but to fix some genetic factor in their lines. She groped for an answer, and as she saw inside her mind, Paul said, they thought they were reaching for me, but I'm not what they expected, and I've arrived before my time, and they don't know it. Mother pressed, Jessica pressed her hands to her mouth. Great mother, he's the Quitsatz Hadarach. She could feel fear. You're thinking I'm the Quitsatz Hadarach, he said. Put that out of your mind. I'm something unexpected. I must get word out to the, one of the schools, she thought. The mate, mating index may show what has happened. They won't learn about me until it's too late, he said. We'll find a place among the Fremen. The Fremen have a saying they credit to Shai Hulud, old father eternity, he said. They say, be prepared to appreciate what you must. And then he thought, yes, my mother, among the Fremen, you'll acquire the blue eyes and a callus beside your lovely nose from the filter tube of your silstute, and you'll bear my sister, St. Alia of the Knife. So here, here we have an intense scene where Paul has the thought, you could not possibly know what I am, and you won't believe it until you see it. And he thought, I'm a seed, right? So he becomes a seed of the future here. And in um, and, and, and sort of going back to that anthropos, and that's quite an intense chapter to read, but going back to the anthroposophical, he talks about the candidate has come to be ready for the experience. He is given what is called symbolically the draft of forgetfulness, the draft, the draft of forgetfulness. Uh, this means that he is initiated into the secret of how to act without allowing himself to be continually disturbed by the lower memory. This is necessary for the initiate, for he must at all times have full confidence in the immediate present. He must be able to wipe out the veil of memory, which envelops man at every moment of his life. If I judge something that happens to me today according to what I expected yesterday, I'm exposed to a multitude of errors. So this is like when Paul says, it just came up upon him, this knowledge of the future, this presence, right? The waking dream. It's not something he can control. But it's also what he controls is he controls his stillness at the heart of it. And you're using some of that Benny Gesserit um, training about letting the fear pass by. Notice in that paragraph how Jessica is feeling fear. And this is what they, Herbert says that the Bene Gesserit could not look to the place that the Quitsat Heterot could see. Naturally, it does not mean the experience gained in life should be disavowed. It should always be kept in mind as clearly as possible. But the second draft given to the initiate is the draft of remembrance. And this is where he remembers the, the ancient history, like the Dune Other Memory. And throughout the Dune Saga, that Bene Gesserit Other Memory becomes very powerful, the idea of looking back. And later... Uh, in future books, it's not only pres prescience seeing the future, but memory, ancestral memory that becomes such a powerful, uh, powerfully aligning to the human experience and what Leto will later call the golden path, which is how can man go forward? And very much so what Steiner was doing with anthroposophy was to give humanity a way forward that is both human and is spiritual, a human-based spirituality, right? Uh, the thought of remembrance, though he acquires the power to have higher mysteries always present on his soul, ordinary memories would be unequal to this. We must become completely united with the higher truths. So will he raise himself to the spiritual sense more and more to the level to which nature has brought him physically. Wow, right? So, um, so yeah, it continues when they're talking about sleep again. During sleep, no communication from the physical sense organs, no perceptions of the ordinary outer world find their way to the human soul. 
in a certain respect, the soul is outside that part of the human body, the so-called physical body, in which the waking life is the medium for sense perception and thinking. The soul is then connected only to the finer bodies, the etheric bodies and the astral bodies. And we can see in that last paragraph where Paul is sort of, um, uh, Paul is channeling that higher life, right? If we go to this quote, uh, we see Paul is channeling that higher life. And uh, later in Dune, when Paul uh, takes the, Is this all right for me to drink? He gestured to the sack in Chani's hands. They want me to drink it. She heard the hidden meaning in his words, realized he had detected the poison in the original unchanged substance, and he was concerned for her. It occurred to Jessica to wonder what the limits of Paul's prescience. His he question revealed her so much. You may drink it, she said. It has been changed. And she looked beyond him to see Stilgar staring down. Now we know you cannot be false, he said. She sensed hidden meaning there, how warm it was and how soothing. Paul saw the drug take hold of his mother. He searched his memory. So this is when Jessica is taking the drug. Drink it, Chani says. She waved to the horn spot of water. If he drank the spice drug with the quintessence of the substance that brought the change into him, he would return to the vision of pure time, of time become space would perch him on the dizzying summit and defy him to understand. From behind Chani, Stilgar said, Drink it, lad. You delay the right. So now Paul is drinking, right? Um, Paul is drinking the water of life. And Paul listened to the crowd then through the wilderness and their voices. Lisan al-Gaib, they said. Muadib. He looked down at his mother. She appeared peacefully asleep in the sitting position, breathing even and deep. A phase out of the future that was his lonely past came to his mind. She sleeps in the waters of life. Chani tugged at his sleeve. Paul took the horn spout to his mouth, hearing the people shout. There was something he can give us. We are alike in a thing, Usul. We each have lost a father to the Harkonnens. Paul followed her. They entered a narrow side. Paul felt the drug beginning to have its unique effect on him. He found steady himself against Chani. The mixture of whipcord and softness he felt beneath her robe stirred his blood. The sensation mingled with the workings, folding future and past into the present, leaving him the thinnest margin, margin of trinocular focus. So here we go, uh, like, uh, like in the Steiner, the past and the, and the future begin to merge in the now, and there's only a, a wider, deeper now. Uh, and Paul felt himself uh, at the center. He held himself poised in the awareness, seeing time stretch out in its weird dimension, delicately balanced yet whirling, narrow yet spread like a net gathering countless worlds and forces, a tight wire that he must walk yet a teeter-totter on which he balanced. On the one side, he could see the Imperium, the Harkonnen called Fade Rautha, who flashed toward him with a deadly blade, the Sardaukar raging off their planet, the Guild conniving and plotting, the Bene Gesserit with their scheme of selective breeding. They lay massed like a thunderhead on the horizon. He held back by no more than the Fremen and their Muad'Dib, the sleeping giant Fremen poised for their wild crusade across the universe. Paul felt himself at the center, at the pivot, where the whole structure turned, walking a thin wire of peace with a measure of happiness. Chani at his side. He could see a time stretching ahead of him, a time of relative quiet in a hidden siege, a moment of peace between the periods of violence. There's no other place for peace, he said. Usul, you're crying, Chani murmured. Usul, my strength, do you give moisture to the dead, to who's dead? <laughs> to the ones not yet dead, he said. Let them have their time of life, she said. Sihaya, he said. I'm no longer afraid, Usul. Look at me. I see what you see when you hold me thus. What do you see? I see us giving love to each other in the quiet between the storms. So many times you've given me comfort and forgetfulness. So, right, right giving forgetfulness. Giving forgetfulness and knowing the past and the future, right? This is the, the, the two gates, sort of, that uh, Steiner talks about. Uh, last last uh, little quote here. 
Uh, he says, the threshold is built out of every feeling of, f of fear remaining in you. This section is called the guardian of the threshold. Uh, when you have crossed my threshold, I shall never for an instant leave your side as a form, form visible to you. And in the future, whenever you act wrongly, you will immediately perceive your guilt as a hideous, demonical distortion of my form. My threshold is built out of every fearing of fear remaining in you. As long as you still have any trace of fear of becoming the, the director of your own destiny. For just as long does a threshold lack something that must be built into it. Hitherto I emerge from your personality. Only when death recalled you from the earthly life, the powers of destiny ruled over you. Visible do I stand thus before you, as I ever have stood invisible behind you in the hour of death. So again, here we have the, the calming notion and also the realization of the immortality and the connectivity, the interconnectivity. And for Paul in, in, in this chapter of Dune, as he's taking the water of life, he's transforming into something that's... Uh, going to bring this horrible uh, uh, war in his name. At the same time, it's the next step that he has to take, sort of resigns to it. Uh, just two quick other readings, just thinking across the Dune books. Obviously, Paul later in the God Emperor of Dune, his son Leto II uh, becomes an even more tyrannical position of destiny you know his golden path requires him not only just to lead a lead a revolution of sorts but also to uh, become uh, uh, a tyrant over mankind to hold mankind to task to evolve right so this is weird evolutionary force that's at play and it's very powerful in uh, Herbert's world building right so from the idea of a fiction fictional world it's fantastic how these very, very real human conditions, like the trials of um, trials of of the centuries, let's call it, can become tests for our ability to become more human. And things that might threaten to remove our humanity actually become the things that show us the importance of that humanity. So I think these are some of those some of those um, themes that come across. Uh, just a quick quote here from the fan fiction Dune Revenant, which takes place way at the end of the of the um, Dune saga. So this takes place thousands of years later. But there's this apocrypha of the hermit. The smell was the first thing. It brought the visions of the Fremen with their children and their blue and blue eyes. For then was a time that humanity first knew the spice and was first to partake in the being of Shai Hulud. I who know the motions of time as a desert knows the passage of time. At the infernal mouth of Shai Hulud, I stood and I took the spice melange that was from his hot breath. And this is what came to pass. This is all known to any and all is due to the spice dream. For these words were first written not on a paper, not in the lines in the sand, but etched into the consciousness that emerged timeless between human and worm. Thus in the first trance these words were written upon eternity, upon the very storms of time itself, by the mystery of melange and Shai Hulud. Things past were present, and places far were near. Still things now never were, and the here was gone. A voice had been spoken, and yet to be spoken it was the audible ear, and the human was with sandworm, and the sandworm was with the human. Uh, and this is sort of the new paths that extend Leto's golden path. Uh, yeah, so maybe just to wrap things up, I have another quick quote from the uh, again we're talking about the great guardian of the threshold and the watchers and I just wanted to share this note here from the Emerald Tablets this is out of Giuseppe Balsam's Necromancy of Nyarlathotep but it says downward in the darkness the thoughts of the Atlanteans, until at last the wrath arose uh, from his Aguanti, the dweller. The word has no English equivalent. It means the state of detachment, speaking the word, calling the power deep in earth's heart. The son of the Amenti heard, and hearing, directing the changing of the flower of fire that burns eternally, changing and shifting, using the Logos, until the great fire changes direction. Over the world then broke the great waters, drowning and sinking, changing earth's balance until the temple of light 
was left standing at the great mount mountains on Undal, still rising out of the water, and some there were to be living, saved from the rush of the fountains. Call to me the master, saying, Gather ye people, gather ye together my people, take them to the arts. Ye have learned from far across the waters, ye, until ye reach the land of the barbarians dwelling in the caves of the desert, and follow them there, and gather up the people in the great ships of the master. Upward we rose into the morning, dark beneath us the temple, suddenly over rose the waters, vanished from the earth until the time appointed. Fast we fled toward the sun of the morning, until beneath us lay the land of the children of Chem. And so the sons of Atlantis entered the land of Chem, which is Egypt. Uh, and like Paul traveling from Caladan to the desert of um, Dune, which is Egyptian in a way, right? So maybe we just uh, leave that here and, 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 and close it back in with the beings of light. Now that the guardian of the threshold, as described above, the product of the past alone is made manifest, right? Paul becomes the Kritzat Haderach, containing only such seeds of the future. Paul is the seed as were woven into the past of time. But the individual must take with him into the future, super sensible world, everything he can draw from the world of the senses. If he were to bring with him only what has been woven into, into his counterpart of the past, his earthly task would only be partly accomplished. So it's not just knowledge of the past, but it's knowledge of the act to the future. The meeting with the second guardian will then describe in narrative form. When the pupil has recognized the things from which he must free himself, an exalted being of light stands before him on the path, right, the golden path. The meeting thus takes place and the organs of thinking, feeling, and willing have so far freed themselves of each other. But now gaze on me. See how immeasurably I am raised above you. You have attained your present degree of perfection through the faculties that were developed in the sense world as long as you're still dependent upon it. But now there must begin for you an era which your liberated powers will work further in the world of the senses. Hitherto you have only recognized yourself, but now having yourself become free, you can liberate all your companions in the sense world. So here we go. The human call to liberate our companions. Um, and to beware of the, the black path, right? And their instructions lead to the good or to nothing at all. It is no part of their task to lead to egoistic blessedness and to mere existence in the supersensible world. From the very outset, it lies in the nature of their task to keep the pupil away from the supersensible world until he can enter it with the will for selfless cooperation. Right, so there you have Steiner's message of anthroposophy uh you know a, a a bit of resonance there between paul's journey some of those touch points on the knowledge of higher worlds uh what do you guys think uh leave a comment below let us know um dune revenant and necromancy of nyarlathotep available on uh, pontus fathom press website you can check out the bookstore below would love to read the comments would really appreciate your help uh, in sharing this, liking it, and uh, subscribing so we could get the algorithm to get this out to more people. And um, if you would like to support us, as I mentioned, the books, Patreon below, and can really look for uh, the time where we can do this as a live podcast. And I think it would be great to have us have a chat going and have it as a group activity. So looking forward to hearing your comments below in the meantime. Uh, hope it was interesting. Let me know what you think, what you'd like to see next. We've, we're going to be doing another Anthroposophy series all month. We'll be doing one on uh, Lucifer and Ariman and um, artificial intelligence. And we'll also be talking about the anime Bleach in the sense of Rudolf Steiner's anthropos anthroposophical... Um, works on occult science and some resonances we see there so similar to this podcast but just with that property so uh thanks a lot for watching everyone uh talk to you down in the comments and we'll see you soon thank you bye bye